everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Night School. I'm Aria. And I'm Christina. And we are streaming from home, but we're streaming on behalf of Nightlife at the California Academy of Sciences, which is our weekly Thursday night event bringing science and art and culture um, to the floor of the Academy, but with Night School back home to you. So um, yeah, I'm just going to throw it over to Christina to get right into it and intro our lineup. We've got a really amazing panel of kelp forest researchers and restoration experts here. Yeah, exactly. So Aria said it all. We're talking about kelp forests. Um, have any of you gone diving in a kelp forest? I've heard it's amazing and cold. Um, but anyway, uh, so first off, we have Dr. Kristen Ellsmore from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and she's going to be giving an um, overview of the state of, Cal of California's kelp forests and kind of talk about why we're focusing a whole night school on them tonight. Um, next up is Tristan McHugh, I'm a subtitle ecologist and kelp forest restoration practitioner from the Nature Conservancy. Um, and then Michael Escrow is here. He's a marine ecologist and senior scientist with the California Ocean Protection Council. Um, and he'll talk about some of the statewide efforts and the policy implications around kelp forest restoration. And then finally, we have Dr. Alyssa Frederick, who's a postdoctoral scholar at UC Davis at the Bode Bodega Marine Lab. Um, and she's talking about the race to save endangered white abalone and stay tuned if you've never seen an abalone face you're in for a treat so. absolutely yeah thanks christina and um as always our program is live so feel free to ask questions in the comments or sorry chat section of youtube and comment section of facebook depending on where you're watching um and let us know if you're a first time watcher or regular um we love we love chatting with you so stay tuned get your questions in Ready to go. <laughs> All right. Kristen's up first. Hello. Thank you all so much for having me. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my screen yet. Oh, there we go. Okay. I will kick us off. Um, thank you so much for the intro. And I am so excited to be here. My name is Kristen Ellsmore, and I'm an environmental scientist with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. I primarily work on kelp forest restoration and management within California's coastal waters. And today I'll be sharing with you a little bit about California's iconic kelp forest ecosystems and providing that uh, broader context to tee you up to hear from your other speakers today. So um, just to get everyone on the same page, um, I would like to introduce everyone to kelp. In, um, so these canopy forming kelps that you can see in the cartoon on the left here are found all over the world and they're marine foundation species that create underwater forests that provide structural habitat and food for hundreds of other organisms. Unlike plants that we have here on land, there are some marine plants, but um, the majority of us probably interface with terrestrial plants a lot more often. They uh, Kelps don't have a formal root system for nutrient uptake or within substrate attachment, like some of our garden plants or trees that actually have all those roots deep in the soil. Instead, they have what's called a holdfast, which is kind of like a sticky pad that anchors them to the seafloor, floor. And consequently, they don't grow very well on sandy substrate and really need this ro uh, hard, rocky reef to adhere to and grow. And some species have gas-filled bladders that help their leaf-like blades float up in the water column and close to the surface and really help them remain suspended in the water column to bring those, those leaf-like blades that uh, really close to the surface where they can get sufficient sunlight for photosynthesis. And, and so in California, we have two dominant canopy forming species that form this, these really thick underwater forests. Macrocystis, which is uh, shown here on the left, is uh, also called giant kelp. And then we have Neriocystis, which is shown here on the right, and it's also called bull kelp, um, more commonly known as bull kelp. And so these two species extend throughout the water column, creating this really nice habitat for hundreds of other organisms. Um, Macrocystis, which again is on the left, has these little gas bladders 
supporting each individual leaf-like blade that su suspends them all the way throughout the water column, as you can see in the little cartoon here. While Nereocystis, which is again shown on the right, has just like that single gas bulb right at the surface that brings those pigtail-like blades up to the, to the top of the water column where they can be nice and close to the sunlight. And so we have both of these species here in California and Macrocystis is predominantly found um, in Southern California and extends up into Central California. And Nereocystis is predominantly found in Northern California, overlapping with Macrocystis in the Central California range. And so these, oops, sorry. The transitions are hard. <laughs> so these, these kelp forest systems differ physically and ecologically along the California coastline and consequently support different community structures and are exposed to different stressors and threats that we have up and down the coastline. So starting with Northern California, this really great cartoon, um, these forests are largely dominated by Nereocystis or that bull kelp that I had mentioned. And they support this really rich understory canopy and tons of invertebrates and fishes, as you can see in this, this graphic here. And some really key players in the dynamics of this system are bull kelp, of course, um, red and purple urchins, which you can see here in the, um, in the schematic as grazers. And, um, and then here we also have Pycnopodia, which is the sunflower star. And that's been a pretty important player in this system up here in the North Coast. In the central coast, we have this, again, that overlap of giant kelp and bull kelp. So we have both of those canopy forming species. And then we also have red and purple urchins as our key grazers here. And sunflower stars or Pycnopodia. And we also have the sea otter, which is a pretty important player in the central California region. And then finally, in Southern California, we have these kelp forest systems are predominantly formed by giant kelp and have some other players. Uh, again, they do have those red and purple urchins, but we also have these secondary consumers that are, um, that are really important to this system. We have the spiny lobster as well as the California sheephead that are playing a big role here. And then I do want to point out, since we do have um, a speaker focused on abalone. We also have abalone, which um, extend throughout the state. But you can see here in this cartoon, um, one that features one of the species that you'll hear more about later today. And so these kelp forest systems provide a suite of ecosystems, what are called ecosystem services. So they, again, like I talked about, they provide this really great habitat structure. They provide it throughout the water column which is really important for creating and facilitating these really rich communities that we know and love in these kelp forest systems. They help facilitate with nutrient cycling and secondary production. So again, supporting a lot of other fish and other species that are really important to these habitats. They support aquaculture, which again, you'll hear a little bit more about later today, this evening. I have a picture of a cute little snail, um, but I'm sure you'll see many more cute photos of snails. And these kelp forests also provide a lot of uh, wonderful ecotourism. Lots of divers and snorkelers and kayakers come from all over the world to, to explore these systems here in California. And then they also support, really importantly, support a lot of fisheries. So in this, these photos here, we have um, some examples of a red urchin here. Uh, spiny lobster, and then they also, kelp gets harvested itself as, um, in a sense, a fishery, but it's, uh, kelp is, of course, not a fish, but um, they are really important in that system. And, and so these kelp forests are found, again, like I had said, all over the world, but um, the, like, all over the world, we're seeing challenges with navigating deforestation and loss of kelp. And that, again, that's a global, global challenge. And this kelp loss can be caused by one or more stressors um, that operate on the system, either independently or synergistically, and can result in these different outcomes of, your, of the habitat. Here in California, um, this, these stressors and shifts have predominantly resulted in urchin barrens. And again, this phenomena of urchin barrens has been explored and, and, and seen worldwide. Um, however, 
this is this is really predominantly a challenge that we see and face here in California. So these these barrens are predominantly um, populated by purple urchins, as you can see here in the cartoon here on the bottom, on the left. But and these purple urchins are native to California and are a natural part of the system, as we had touched on earlier. Those different key players in the system. However, California has been experiencing widespread and persistent barrens in several areas along the coastline. And so in California, these, oh, sorry, I'm having some time, some lags here. So um, as we've talked about, these kelp forest ecosystems are ecologically, culturally, and economically really important in California. And these, these stressors, these multiple stressors that we have been experiencing, such as ocean warming and poor upwelling and sea star die-off, so the Pycnopodia in particular, we've lost uh, severely along the coastline here. And an increase in purple urchins, as well as point and non-point source pollution. Um, all of these stressors have impacted the system and resulted in kelp forest declines throughout the state. And in this time series of kelp canopy cover, it's broken up by north, central, and south coast, as you can see here on the right. It's a time series of kelp canopy cover throughout the state. And we see that there's these really severe and persistent declines, particularly in Northern California, followed by the marine heat wave, which uh, was present in the Northeast Pacific and started in 2014 and persisted through 2016. The initiation of that is indicated by that vertical dashed red line. So you can see that huge drop off and persistent drop in, in that Northern California kelp canopy. And these dynamics are discussed in more detail within the giant kelp and bull kelp enhanced status report, which can be found on the department's marine species portal on our website. And this was released uh, fairly recently, actually, in December of 2021. So if you haven't seen it yet, uh, go check it out. It's again on our department website in our marine species portal. So um, as I talked about, there's been this really severe and persistent decline of bull kelp in Northern California. And you'll hear a little bit more about some, some actions that are being pursued in the space from uh, both Tristan and a little bit um, also from Mike later this evening. But I just wanted to um, share with you that we have also had this, um, this taken to the states, taken this action to adopt precautionary measures to protect, protect against further reductions in this bull kelp in this Northern California region. And so these actions include temporary closures of commercial bull kelp harvest in Sonoma and Mendocino counties and a limited commercial harvest in Humboldt and Del Norte counties. And so these regulation changes are intended to sunset upon the adoption of the statewide kelp restoration and management plan, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, so just highlighting, these are sort of a, an interim temporary to tide us over until we have this statewide management plan for kelp. And so the, oops. <sighs> So working towards this, uh, this kelp restoration and management plan, this is going to be a statewide and adaptive ecosystem-based uh, kelp restoration and management plan. And the department is engaged in several exciting research and restoration efforts. Again, which you'll hear more about these, uh, some of these partnered efforts from Tristan McHugh of the Nature Conservancy later this evening, and um, some other elements that Mike uh, Escrow of the Ocean Protection Council will dig into. So um, in addition, the department also worked with the California Sea Grant and Ocean Protection Council to develop a call for proposals in 2020 that addressed priority information gaps for the development of the kelp restoration toolkit, which is nested within the kelp restoration and management plan. And there were six funded projects uh, to help pursue and address these knowledge gaps. Um, and the names of those projects are listed here, but you can find out more about them on Sea Grant's website. And these six research projects are well underway, so stay tuned for some exciting results in the near future as those projects um, work towards wrapping up. Another piece here you can see in the, the figure or the cartoon on the left here is an interim action plan for protecting and restoring California's kelp forests, which was 
developed in partnership with the Ocean Protection Council and the department and was released a little over a year ago. And this action plan highlights several key research and pilot restoration efforts that are underway, as well as identifies important knowledge gaps and priorities for action over the next few years. And Mike Esker will dig into the contents of this document and some exciting stuff uh, a little later this evening. So um, with that, I will just say thank you so much for listening and hopefully that queued up uh, Tristan and the other speakers. Uh, for digging into more about kelp. There will be time to ask questions later on in the evening, but if you have questions after that um, or just want to reach out and chat, uh, feel free to email me at kelp at wildlife.ca.gov. And with that, I will hand it over to Tristan. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I will go ahead and just start sharing my screen. So it looks like your slides got disconnected. Can you add them again to Ooh. StreamYard? Yeah. Yes. Give me one second. Fun technical stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll let you know when, when we can see them. Sounds good. How's that? Let's see. All right. Beautiful. Good? Okay. Yep. Here we All go. All right. Cool. Um, thank you. And nice job, Kristen. That was really nice. Um, I am here today to talk to you about kelp forest restoration, but first, my name is Tristan McHugh. I'm the kelp project director with the Nature Conservancy. I'm based in Mendocino, California, which is kind of the epicenter of um, some of this really big kelp loss that we've been seeing. And I'm a scuba diver, and so is Kristen, and so is Mike. And I think that's kind of what brings this unique perspective to the table here is um, I'd like to, you know, kind of build on what Kristen was talking about with regards to the kelp ecosystem and share with you some um, next steps. Like what, what are we thinking about for ways to preserve and safeguard this ecosystem into the future? So I'll go ahead and start. So again, kelp is an incredibly important habitat and it's uh, facing some really severe declines, not only in California, but globally. And of course, kelp provides many benefits, not only for the little critters underwater, but also for us. Like we're extremely tied to this, this forest. It's incredibly important to our survival, our health. And the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals actually listed um, you know, kelp as one of those direct supporters of a healthy world for us, including uh, developmental two goals for zero hunger, um, eight world and economic growth, uh, 13 climate action, and 14 life underwater. So uh, kelp ecosystems being healthy checks a lot of boxes for us. And unfortunately, the earth is warming and it's facing some really intense uh, changes. And these ecosystems are having to uh, change how they function very rapidly. And so with that, you know, I'm not saying that to discourage us, but just to keep in mind that these disturbance events of these ecosystems are forecasted and expected to come more frequently and intensely in a changing climate. And so a lot of us, um, I'm sure you at home too, are thinking about like, what can we do? What can we possibly do to safeguard, protect, bolster these habitats? Um, what can be done? So um, myself at the Nature Conservancy, you know, I work very close with Kristen and Mike and a number of like wonderful humans in the state and beyond to think about this. And we're thinking about restoration. Um, that's an option. And uh, by definition, restoration is the process of assisting recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged or destroyed. And historically, um, this has been from um, you know, some natural causes, of course, but again, as we're entering this new phase, these perturbations are just adding on top of each other, like Kristen mentioned, right? You have loss of a apex predator, like uh, Pycnopodia, the sunflower star. You also have these heat waves, just a lot kind of coming in. So whatever we do for restoration needs to be multi-pronged and um, adaptive. So we're really exploring a suite of opportunities. But today I'd like to talk to you about some of what we're 
doing here in Northern California, where we've lost over 96% of bull kelp habitat between 2014 and 2019. So at the Nature Conservancy, we're really exploring, um, and again, we work with a number of partners, but we're really thinking about these three general facets to um, our work and how we approach restoration. The first is mapping and monitoring. And the idea behind that is if we know where kelp is, how much there is, and the historical dynamics, right? So how much it changes from year to year and um, over time, we can use this information to inform strategic restoration and management. Um, the second prong is reset. And I think about this bucket as how can we wipe the slate clean? So how can we get the reef, so the, the physical floor that kelp would attach to, um, how can we prime it for a settlement of spores um, and growth? And the last one is reforesting. And the idea behind that is what ways can you possibly like put more kelp into the ecosystem. So that includes things like kelp farming, uh, green gravel, and outplanting, which we'll get to, um, but ultimately to bolster these populations. So I'd like to spend a couple seconds just going into each of these buckets. So mapping and monitoring, this is really based around, um, again, with this mass uh, change, this mass loss of kelp, we want to understand these changes in dynamics. And so we want to know truly how much loss there was and where these strongholds of kelp were um, at really high resolutions that had ever been obtained and mapped at scale. Because I think what's kind of interesting here is um, historically you could use a certain technology like aerial uh, flyovers by planes to understand the kelp dynamics. But with this marine heat wave and all these other stressors, kelp got so low, there was so little kelp that you needed to get this really fine resolution scale data to actually uh, see it. So that's where we started exploring. And so researchers right now are in the process of exploring these different spatial resolutions and capabilities. So how much do they cost? What are their limitations? Where do they thrive? And um, we're ultimately trying to map the size shape and connectivity of these kelp canopies. I like this photo. Um, I think it's pretty cool. This is off um, Saunders Reef in Point Arena, if you're familiar. But anyways, um, so I think about like these three different um, uh, kind of ways that you can map kelp. So the first is through uh, Landsat. And so this has a 30 meter resolution. It's coast wide. It's at a global scale. and um, it is done via satellite. And so we've been working with UCLA, Woods Hole um, Oceanographic Institute, and have developed this uh, website, which is launching soon, called kelpwatch.org, which is an open source web tool displaying changes in kelp canopy dynamics over time, which is kind of fun, from 1984 into last year, 2021. Um, along the entire West Coast. And this is the world's largest open source dynamic map of kelp forest canopies. And um, it's just a really rad tool that I suggest you look into as soon as it launches live. Um, the next one is Planet, which is three meter resolution, and that's done regionally. And it can correlate with occupied aerial um, surveys done by planes that had taken place by the Department of Fish and Wildlife and others. Um, the last one, this is like super, super fine scale, right? So three centimeter resolution. This is what I was talking about with capturing those like really tiny kelp beds. Um, this is super fine scale spatial resolution and ourselves, the Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary and many other partners have led the state's largest marine um, resource drone surveys in the North Coast since 2019. Um, and so expect um, there will be some scientific papers coming out to publish this, but you may have seen some of this work already shared in the SF Chronicle um, a couple months ago. So that is our mapping and monitoring. All right, moving on to reset the ecosystem. How can we wipe the slate clean? Um, in Northern California, as Kristen mentioned, our big hurdle right now is warming ocean was also um, 
getting kelp to grow in prime habitat where unfortunately there were an overabundance of native purple urchin. And we shouldn't demonize the purple urchin. They're just trying to live and they're native to the ecosystem, but we need to think of innovative ways of reducing their densities in key habitats. And so um, we've started a exploring these ways to do it. And one of them that I worked again, really close with Kristen and Mike on um, is this partnership based approach with um, the state commercial fishermen and a community science group, um, Reef Check, who you should look into too if you're a diver. Um, and so we're about to enter our third year of exploring the effectiveness of commercial urchin divers reduce urchins down to a density that's understood to push a kelp forest back into that kelp state. And so, so far we've found that urchin divers can do this. Um, and they can keep them there over time. And over the next month or so, we're actually going to be releasing a report um, that covers like the entirety of this project that I unfortunately don't have time to get into right now, but super exciting. And if you are a member of the public, you can also get involved in urchin harvesting events. And I suggest you check out the Department of Fish and Wildlife's website to learn more. Um, next, urchin trapping. So this is another method, right? So if you can't actually, uh, if, or maybe not if you can't, um, another method to maybe reduce urchin densities might not be hand harvesting, sending divers under, we're also looking at urchin trapping. So um, how can we maybe use these traps like a fire break or an urchin for magnet? Um, and what kind of soak time and bait is ideal? So we're exploring this innovative tool to also um, potentially reduce urchin densities in the North Coast. So more on this uh, soon. I'm gonna kind of zip through here because I'm running out of time. Um, the next is market-based solutions. So we have a lot of urchin coming in. And so the backside of restoration is how do we keep it going long-term? And that's finding an economic incentive for urchin. So we're also interested um, in finding food and non-food uses for urchin. Um, and so other than human reducing urchin, we also have exploring natural predator introduction. And Kristen mentioned sunflower stars um, were severely hit by disease. And so um, we're also directing and supporting a really big body of work um, to protect and recover the sunflower sea star. And so we're leading a captive breeding program with Jason Hoden out of um, University of Washington to explore how this may touch down in California and just understand a little bit more about that really severe marine disease. Okay, and then the last bucket is reforesting. And so this includes um, thinking about like other ways that we can bolster kelp. And so in that center photo, we have um, a graduate student from UC Santa Cruz that we're working with who's looking at green gravel. So actually putting little gametophytes, like little baby, baby, baby kelps um, on rocks that you could maybe throw in the ocean, maybe they grow. Um, we're also looking at putting kelp on lines in a kelp farm. And as Krista mentioned, um, kelp forest loss and restoration reaches far beyond California. So in those red dots are all the places where restoration activities are taking place. There are projects happening now in real time. And um, the first recorded kelp restoration project was actually in Japan in the 1700s. And since there, there have been um, you know, close to 250 documented projects um, over the course of about 50, 70 years. So um, 16 countries, five languages, it's incredible. And um, we're launching a kelp restoration guidebook. Um, after two years of work, 50 expert contributors, including Kristen and Mike on this call from nine countries. And it's really exciting. So this will be launching this year in the next couple months. Um, so stay tuned to learn more about other communities that have been facing this challenge. And with that, just say thank you to all the people who contributed to this work um, that I shared. And that's it for me. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for um, spending your St. Patty's Day learning about kelp, which is green, I guess, so that it's appropriate. Um, my name is Mike Escrow. Hopefully you guys can all see my slides. Um, I'm a marine ecologist and a senior scientist with the California Ocean Protection Council. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with OPC's work, we're basically the governor's advisor 
on coastal and ocean policy. So we work very closely um, with the department and other sister agencies on managing our state's coast and ocean. Um, and I lead our biodiversity program, which um, includes protecting and restoring kelp forests, which is a huge priority um, for OPC. So I wanna start um, just for some context with a video here. Tristan mentioned that all three of us are divers. Um, for those of you who haven't had the privilege of getting to dive in these ecosystems, I wanted to show you this. I took this video um, last summer on a liveaboard dive trip. It's at Santa Cruz Island, I think. There goes one of my dive buddies. This is what a healthy kelp ecosystem should look like. It's an underwater forest. Um, and it's really the happiest place on earth for me. This is like going to church um, because this is where I fell in love with, with our coast. Um, I was a scuba instructor long before I got involved in marine policy. And so, yeah, happiest place on earth for me right here. And now I wanna show you another video um, this was a kelp forest. So again, you know, this devastation that Kristen and Tristan have talked about, um, this is what it looks like underwater. And this is a dive I had a chance to do with, uh, that guy right there is the president of the California Fish and Game Commission. We had the secretary of the California Environmental Protection Agency along with us. And we went out to, to check out what it looked like firsthand. Um, it's just devastation. There's no underwater forest. The only thing left is urchins, right? And so I think this really, you know, these are different systems, these are different times, these are different places in the state. So this is by no means a, a before and after or a scientific comparison at all. But I just wanted to give you that context of what things should look like and in many parts of the state, um, what they do look like right now, right? So I think that gives good context to graphs like this. Kristen already showed this graph, um, high level, regional summaries of how kelp is doing in California. And, you know, following that marine heat wave on that top graph, you can see that crash on the North Coast and then subsequent lack of recovery, right, through 2020. Um, kelp is generally pretty variable, but that crash and lack of recovery is really unprecedented. We haven't seen that before. On the Central Coast, we saw um, some patchy declines uh, and then on the South Coast, we saw, you know, an initial decline followed by a pretty quick recovery. So things are different across the state. I also want to point out that this um, is based on satellite data, right, which is 30 meter resolution. So we're missing a little bit of the smaller scale uh, local trends here that, you know, things like drones, like Tristan was just talking about, or even higher resolution satellite imagery can um, can illuminate for us, right? So things like the Monterey Peninsula, I'm in Santa Cruz, so the Monterey reefs are my backyard. Um, there's a lot of reefs there where in some places things look really good, um, like that bottom picture with the harbor seal there. In other places, they look just like the North Coast. So very, very patchy, very weird dynamics there. Um, some of you guys may have seen this article, um, seen this headline making the rounds that there was a bounce back last year as ocean conditions cooled down and it's, it's true, it's really good news, but I, I don't wanna like um, be pessimistic about this, but I do wanna just be realistic about what our baseline is. Even with that doubling in canopy that we saw last year, we're still only at about, depending on your baseline, 25 to 30% of what a normal year would be, right? So we are kind of in a resurgence, um, but we're still not back to normal. And there are lots of things that are constraining recovery right now, including kind of going off what Tristan said, that the reefs haven't been reset, right? Those urchins are still there. And in a lot of places, they're constraining recovery back to what we'd hope to see um, as normal. So the reason I'm here today, um, Kristen and Tristan really already covered a lot of this background so well. Um, I wanna talk about what the state is doing about this, right? So we have an action plan for protecting and restoring kelp in California that I think um, the Cal Academy team is gonna drop in the chat. And this plan, you know, really summarizes different research and restoration initiatives, highlights knowledge gaps, and sets forth priorities for action um, in a bunch of different areas. And it's those different areas that I want to go through today with you. So first off, we talk about enlisting local communities. Um, and we really could not do this work without our partners, without the partnerships that we've established. So I was really struck by the last slide that Tristan showed just now with the list of partners. That's a huge list. There's NGOs like TNC, right? There's academics, there's community-based organizations, um, really incredible opportunities to get work done 
that the state can't do on its own, that none of us can do on its own. So we're engaging with California Native American tribes who are the original stewards of our coast and ocean. Um, we're collaborating with diving, fishing, and harvester communities. We're really trying to co-develop knowledge with those folks that are out there in the water, on the water, um, and know these systems, know what's going on, and often are the most deeply impacted um, by what's going on. And this, I just want to call out this guy, John. Um, this is one of the divers that we've worked with on the Mendo Restoration Project that Tristan was talking about. Um, and John actually invented an underwater vacuum for clearing reefs, for removing urchins. And he spent money out of his own pocket to build the damn thing in his garage. And that's the kind of passion that we're talking about. When we're talking about local communities, like those are the kinds of people that we want on our team. So we're just so grateful for everyone who's been willing to, um, to partner with us in these ways. We're also investing in science. Um, everything we do at OPC is driven by science, but I want everyone to know that we're not just handing out money for scientists to sit back and study the problem, right? We want actionable research that delivers solutions for our ecosystems um, and for coastal communities. So some of the things that we're looking at right now are developing metrics um, of kelp forest ecosystem health, trying to implement statewide monitoring based on those metrics. So that would be you know, things like canopy monitoring, like Tristan talked about, but also scuba based monitoring. So we can also get a peek um, under the water to see what's actually going on in these communities. And then using monitoring data to forecast changes so that managers can be more proactive um, and have more of an opportunity to respond before things maybe get as bad as they did last time. Um, and finally, you know, I think everyone can see there's a clear need here to develop long term strategies, right? The ocean's changing um, and we can't manage it like we used to. We can't manage kelp as just a single species or, or a two species fishery, right? We need to manage the entire ecosystem and consider all those interactions um, that Kristen discussed at the top of her talk. And so, you know, people throw around that term ecosystem-based management, I think, without really knowing what it means. Um, so we're trying to figure out what it means and kelp is the perfect place to start. One of the things we're doing in service of ecosystem-based management is building a statewide restoration toolkit. Um, and so that includes various options for, for some of those resetting uh, things that Tristan talked about. So this guy right here, um, this is Grant. This is one of the commercial fishermen we're partnering with up on the North Coast, clearing urchins um, out at Noyo Bay, but also reforesting, right? Things like green gravel seeding, actually outplanting or transplanting kelp. Um, as well as, as part of that toolkit, the ecological and social circumstances where those different tools are likely to be the most effective in our state and globally too. So to wrap up, um, there's a lot we still don't know, right? There's a lot of questions. What exactly happened in 2014 to 2016? We've got kind of a conceptual model, but there's still a lot of pieces. It's kind of a murder mystery. There's a lot of pieces that we don't quite understand yet. What's gonna happen next? Um, climate change is here, right? When's the next marine heat wave? When's the next marine disease? Um, so what's, what's coming on the horizon? Like I talked about just now, what are the most effective methods of kelp restoration in California and when and where should we pursue them, right? Um, what are the baselines to which we should seek to restore these systems? And how should kelp protection and restoration be integrated with other management measures that are out in the ocean already? Like marine protected areas is one that comes up all the time. Um, and one that I'm really fascinated with is how can different ways of knowing about the world, so including indigenous traditional knowledge, like I mentioned, you know, our partnerships with tribes really deepen our understanding of what's going on out there and what we can do about it. Um, we're working hard to answer these questions, right? We're working hard to turn back the tide on this one and, and restore what was lost to the extent that we can. But looking forward, we really need to ready these places for climate change. Um, we weren't ready last time, I'll be honest. It, it took everybody by surprise. The severity and the extent of what happened, we just weren't ready. But now we know, right? Now we know that that's out there. We know that the possibility ability exists, that it's going to happen again. We know that climate change is here and that marine heat waves and other stressors are going to be more frequent and more severe. So now we can be more ready. Um, and proactive climate ready management really has two critical components. It's about conserving these ecosystems, conserving these underwater forests, but it's also about supporting thriving coastal communities 
um, those people, those human communities on the coast that depend on these systems for survival, really. Um, and I'll, I'll be honest, this is really hard work. I think that you've probably taken away from these three talks right now that, that it's tough. But um, I want to paraphrase a, a dear friend of mine who used to work at the Department on Kelp. Um, California's got the best scientists in the world on this. We've got the most passionate coastal communities. So if we can't do it here, it just can't be done. Um, and so that's why I'm really honored to work for OPC. I'm excited to work on this issue. And I think despite the, the challenges, I'm really optimistic about the road ahead. Um, so thank you so much for your time tonight. Really an honor to be on this panel um, with such cool and qualified speakers. My email is right there. I'm sure Cal Academy team will put it in the chat. That action plan link is in the chat. Um, please reach out if you have any questions at all or just want to talk further about this. Um, I'm looking forward to Q&A. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much, Mike. We're going to bring back everybody to the screen. I'll wait for Kristen to come back, but uh, oh, there she is. All right, we've got a full a full panel discussion um, tonight. So, yeah, I mean, I guess one of the first questions we have is like, how long does it take to get kelp back to full size? Like, how how much is that an issue with restoration of these of these places? I can jump in on yeah. that a little bit. Um, that's a really good question. And I think it depends on where you're working and what species you're talking about. I'm sorry, I'm like a ghost. <laughs> sorry. Um, we'll just retreat into the kelp. Um, actually, uh, speaking of that, some of the kelp actually in this photo in my background is restored kelp. Um, this is work done um, down in Southern California with the Bay Foundation and uh, at least through experience with that project and that restoration activity. So this is giant kelp here, completely different species from bull kelp, as we talked about. Um, this, uh, working in this system, it took about 90 days for that kelp forest to go, or the system to go from after that clearing of and reducing urchin densities from bare rock to surface canopy. Mm. Um, but that is a very different system mm -hmm. than what we have going on up in the North Coast, and it's a different species. And so that's something that's really exciting that we are hoping to learn from this project that Tristan um, had mentioned that Mike, Tristan, and I have been working on, among many others, is figuring out what that time scale is. How long does it really take to recover? And so um, it depends on your system, it depends on your species, and also part of the answer is we don't know yet. And we're really looking forward to finding out. So, yeah, right. that makes a ton of sense. And um, kind of like just building off urchins, uh, we have so many urchin questions. We all um, do. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. Oh my gosh, no, no, it's, like seriously, like they're such mind boggling little, little dudes. But um, so, so kind of a big question is just like what makes purple urchins so successful specifically at just eating <laughs> kelp. Um, and could could you talk a little bit more about that, like the urchin specifically? I'm gonna punt that over to Kristen. She's our <laughs> she's our invert. She's our invert gal. Um, I'll do my best, but there are so many invert and uh, urchin specialists out there. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. And I will do my best to provide an answer, but I think there's definitely uh, a lot of people who who just know the ins and outs of purple urchins in particular really well. They are extremely hardy. We've uh, definitely seen them persist and survive in some pretty gnarly conditions. And there's actually some pretty exciting work um, in one of the projects that um, I had mentioned where California Sea Grant and the Ocean Protection Council funded for the part of the kelp recovery research program to really understand some of these, these thresholds that uh, maybe urchins are able to survive and kelp isn't. And that might be driving some of the patterns that we're seeing about where kelp persists mm -hmm. or where kelp is able to hang on, but urchins um, and where urchins are really, really coming through. Um, yeah, they're just like, they've been around for a very, very long time, evolutionarily speaking. They've been, they're just have this incredible evolutionary tree and they, they're just 
really resilient and can handle a lot of stress. And I, I'm sorry, that's not a very good answer, but we are. We're trying to really learn where where some of those bounds are because they might be helping inform us to where these kelp forests are going to be more resilient to to where maybe urchins don't do as well, but kelp yeah. can withstand and hang hang tight. So yeah, yeah. I don't know, Tristan or Mike, if you have anything to add there. No, well, I we, think yeah, we have actually like a follow up question. Sorry, um, to that that might be well suited for Tristan or Mike to answer. But um, Keenan in in the audience was asking, like, at what point do we know with all of these like harvesting methods that urchins aren't being over harvested, like on the other end of the extreme? Um, and and how does their biology play into that? <laughs> yeah. Um... I think just from like the, I, Keenan, I think that's a great question because you get at the point of, you know, these are native species. They're, they're responding, right? They're not these like demon creatures. They're like, they're, they're just responding to these like changes that are happening really fast. And so I think that's like a very delicate balance. And I think personally, that's why marine protected areas are in place, right? They're that natural spot where like state marine reserves right like that's that spot where you can't take urchin right so for example um northern california when this big like urchin bit uh came online there was this really and maybe mike you can speak to this too like there's a really big push from the recreational dive community to do something and so um it was opened up like at first it was from 35 urchin to day per day to it went to 20 gallons and then it went to 40 gallons and there's a sunset on that after a certain amount of time um on top of that um you like state marine reserves right those like those like no touch areas you can't do that activity right mm -hmm. that's that spot like you don't touch um which i think is important for evaluating that question and when we're thinking about also like public engagement, there are also, I think I saw a question in the chat. Um, there are also a couple designated areas where the public can get involved in smashing efforts. So other than like heart, like hand harvesting where that 40 gallons exists, there's like one sp specific spot in Northern California, which is Casper Cove, mm -hmm. um, where you can operate under your recreational license. So. Um, I'll just kind of leave it there and maybe punt it to Mike or Kristen about maybe like the stateside view of, of that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's why monitoring and statewide ecosystem level monitoring is so important, right? To look at status and trends of, of these different players in the system. Um, there are plenty of purple urchins. Um, I mean, in some places they sit spine to spine. I think over the course of two years, <laughs> We took out what thirty five thousand pounds, so like seventeen yeah. tons of urchins Ooh. out of a ten acre restoration site. That was oh. what it took to get urchin densities down to a level where we thought we might get kelp back. Um, so we're not at a point where I'm concerned about purple urchin populations. Red urchins are a different story. Um, really? Red urchins are not exploding in such numbers as purples. Um, and they're really important from a fishery perspective. There's, they're really, really important um, fished species in California. So I think, you know, making sure, for example, that if we're going out and targeting purple urchins, you know, maybe the rules are slightly different for red urchins. But then again, red urchins also eat kelp. So maybe you have to take out some red urchins in order mm -hmm. to get kelp back. But um, but you really need to be monitoring yeah. those those different levels of all the different players to get an idea of, it's all about balance, right? It's all about we're trying to intervene to restore some balance to a system that's lost balance. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, once balance is back, like, I'll be honest, I know divers who want to go out there and kill every single purple urchin in the state of California. And that's not our goal, right? Urchins mm -hmm. are part of the system. They're native species. They're not demon creatures. Um, but things are out of whack. And we're trying to, you know, get things back to normal. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll also add to that in that um, that threshold number that uh, Tristan had mentioned, I think Mike had also mentioned in their, their talks, is that was identified as a number where the, that's like a, a number that urchins persist in healthy kelp forests. And so that that isn't just some random number that was selected. And so mm -hmm. that kind of ties into how do you, that that's a target threshold that was determined to facilitate 
a healthy, productive kelp forest ecosystem. So we're not taking in, in pursuit, at least in these pilot projects, we're not clear, like Mike had said, we're not going all the way down to zero. That's not the goal. It's to maintain mm -hmm. that balance and get it back. And so that does take a lot of monitoring and making sure that we aren't over reducing, right? We don't want to go too far across that threshold. But I also think it's important to understand that we are still fine tuning what that threshold is. Um, there, I've seen some, some notes in the chat about red urchins. Mm -hmm. It depends on where you are along the coastline. Here in California, we haven't seen that same red urchin barren uh, scenario, but that doesn't mean that doesn't exist elsewhere in the world or other places along our Western coastline. And so I just do wanna point out that even here within California, this, those stretches of coastline are unique. And so that is a, an exciting challenge that we do have um, to face in managing, developing these restoration tools and management plan for a very dynamic and um, different, like a, a state where we have these really different ecosystems that um, build on each other and are very much interconnected, but may have really unique suites of characters and suites of challenges that we have to address. And so um, just to, to point out that those those thresholds are are not dropping down to zero and also that mm -hmm that red urchin densities are higher um, elsewhere in the world. And so just being cognizant of that, that these different areas are, are unique and being able to pull that into our approach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think um, we definitely have questions about how scuba divers can help, but also just the general public who are maybe afraid of diving <laughs> or how can they help? Um, you want to go ahead, Mike? Yeah, sure. I'll, maybe I'll do like high level and then and then um, you guys can drill down maybe into specific projects. I mean, I think we get this question all the time and it's such yeah. a good question because it feels like one of those things, especially if you're not a diver, where it's like, well, I don't know, how am I supposed to help from land? Um, so I think, you know, there's, there's different ways you can help. You can help in terms of individual projects on the dock, um, volunteers for, for dockside monitoring for some of these efforts. If you are a diver, you can help in the water. Um, recreational divers can go out and smash urchins at these two different locations that I mentioned. Um, there are urchin removal events that might be starting up again at different places where you can't smash, but you can harvest. Um, you know, you can support those efforts from a kayak if you want to. Um, if you're a scuba diver, you can volunteer with Reef Check to help participate in some of the ecological monitoring um, that's helping drive our, our data analysis on these efforts. But also more broadly, I mean, remember, this is a climate change problem. So anything that that you feel personally comfortable that you can do in your life to, you know, to a mitigate your own climate change, you know, your your own carbon footprint, your own climate change impact, but also, you know, given the scale at which individuals can operate, right? Push for bigger changes in the world. Vote for people that you think are going to do a good job at advancing, you know, the interests of kelp and, and the coast and ocean. My job means nothing if the seven member council that I staff, right? If those guys like the president of the Fish and Game Commission and the secretary that I was talking about diving with, if they don't care, then it doesn't matter what I do because they make the decisions, right? And so voting, I think, is really honestly one of the biggest things that you can do. Um, but Tristan and Kristen, I know you guys have thoughts as well. No, you, you hit it pretty good. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's like full encompassing, honestly. It's like, you know, not settling for anyone who doesn't take climate change seriously. Um, you know, I think that's a really big one for me personally. Um, but I think it's also, um, e even if you're not a diver, there are skills that you can contribute to this larger effort, right? It's not just about like going underwater and doing the thing. We also need people to um, develop films, to educate mm -hmm. the public, um, to spend time in classrooms with kids. Like there's so much, like if, basically like insert your skill here and if you can like <laughs> help in it i think you could you could really like you can go to the fences because there's a lot of folks like chris and mike myself and we're like scrapped for time and a lot of nonprofit and government agencies are like super scrapped and like if you could donate your time um i think especially like spending time with kids and like going outside and doing all that like that's that's pretty next level yeah 
Yeah, I don't really have anything to add. You guys really covered it other than just, again, reiterating, just staying engaged with the process mm -hmm. and the how the how the kelp is doing. I mean, again, like Mike said, we can't, no one person can do this alone. And so we really, this is a collaborative effort beyond just like a formal project collaboration. This is a statewide collaboration, if you will. Like we all need each other to engage in this. And so it's just been really great to see this so far. And so just staying engaged and, and reaching out with questions and, um, and, and chatting with us too. Like we, we, like Tristan said, we are strapped for time, but that is so important. We do wanna talk to you and we wanna engage. We wanna hear what you're seeing, what you're thinking. And so please just do reach out and we'll do our best to, to chat as much as we can. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, yeah, all the links that you've shared, um, we're going to put them in the description of this YouTube video after so that you can find them again. Um, very excited to see kelpwatch.org when it's up and running. Um, but yeah, um, thanks so much. That's all we have time for right now. Thanks so much for being here. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks us. so much for having Thanks us. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah. Good night. Good night. <laughs> um, and so next, earlier earlier this week, uh, I pre-recorded a segment with Dr. Alyssa Frederick about um, white abalone. She she breeds white abalone to help mm -hmm. to help Lots bring them back. Yeah, yeah. So um, <laughs> I'm gonna play that right now. Hi, thanks so much for inviting me to speak about white abalone. Uh, my name is Alyssa Frederick. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm a postdoc at the Bodega Marine Lab, which is part of UC Davis. And I'm delivering this talk from Bodega Bay, which sits on the occupied and unceded land of the Coast of Miwok and Southern Pomo people, for whom abalone are incredibly culturally and ecologically important. And I'd also like to acknowledge the Tongva and Ajachiman nations, whose land is within white abalone's native range. The word abalone comes from Rumson, which is traditionally spoken in what is now the Monterey Bay area. So we often think of abalone um, as shells or adornment, and that's the way that most of us interact with abalone unless we or our families fish for them. But abalone are marine snails that live on rocky shores. And when alive, this is what they look like underneath those beautiful shells. They're really adorable. Those are eyes, the things that look like eyes. Um, and they also have these long, beautiful tentacles and white. This is a photo of white abalone or they have this beautiful orange foot. Um, so they are these adorable animals that live in those beautiful shells. There are seven species of abalone in North America and they span the coastlines um, from about Southern Alaska to the tip of the Baja Peninsula on this part of the Pacific coast. And white abalone are in this gray range, um, which is the smallest range of all the seven species that we have here. And it's also the deepest water species. And apart from being adorable and awesome marine inverts, abalone hold a ton of significance for us and our environment. So they're of immense cultural importance, both for food and other reasons to native peoples. Um, and fishing for abalone also became an important industry later for Asian American immigrants and then later to other colonizers. And sustenance and recreational fishing until a few years ago when the fishery was closed was a huge part of California culture. Um, they're raised in sustainable aquaculture now, um, which is the photo in the middle. Here's a stack of red abalone um, at the cultured abalone farm in Galita. Um, and their presence in kelp forests, which is the, the furthest two photos on the right, um, supports healthy coastal ecosystems. And that's partly by competing with sea urchins for space, which helps prevent those sea urchins from eating entire kelp forests, which is the last photo all the way on the right, is a kelp forest that's overrun by sea urchins and creates what's called an, an urchin barren, where they've basically destroyed a lot of the forest. So in a, in a timeline of abalone fishing techniques, starting from the 1850s on the left in this figure, all the way to the 90s on the right, um, we can see how the harvesting of abalone changed and people moved um, deeper using new technologies um, and different types of um, 
underwater breathing technology to get deeper to the abalone that live at those greater depths. And these techniques and the use of them led to an extreme overfishing of abalone. So photos like this one and this one, um, which are just pot, these huge piles of abalone shells from commercial fishing. They weren't uncommon from the, those time periods. And overfishing really depressed a lot of the populations in, of abalone in California. And another big threat that they've had to contend with in the wild is disease. So this photo on the left shows black abalone um, at a pretty high abundance. Um, and then within two years, um, the same location, um, if you took a photo, would be the photo on the right. And there's scars where the abalone used to live, but almost no abalone left. And that was the result of a disease that came through in the um, early mid 80s. Um, and it just decimated and devastated a lot of the populations of abalone that were left. And this, the combined, the combined threats ended up leaving the first two marine invertebrates um, on the endangered species list being white and then black abalone and listed in 2001 and 2009. Um, so this disease is called withering syndrome and it is caused by a bacteria that gets into their gut and it go, the animal go from healthy looking like full foot um, which is the top photo all the way on the right if we flipped over the shell that's what we would see um to this animal on the bottom which is just totally withered away and we can barely see um kind of any of the animal left so that was a pretty devastating disease and it wiped out a lot of animals um between the disease and the sheer amount of abalone being fished, all species of abalone became depressed and limited. Um, but white abalone really underwent just an extreme overfishing pressure. Um, so this graph on the right shows commercial landings of five of the different species of abalone in California. Um, and the, the, the vertical line all the way on the right, so the last vertical line is when that disease emerged. And if you look at commercial landings, white abalone weren't even being fished commercially at that point, and that's because we fished them all out, we ate them all. Um, and so they, this was an, like a, just an extreme loss for this species. 99% of the animals were fished out within a decade that they were commercially fished. 99%, that's a lot. Um, we're lucky that any were left. Um, because abalone are broadcast spawners, which means that they expel sperm and eggs into the water column, males and females need to be pretty close together if their gametes are going to join um, and become the next generation. Um, they're really bad at long distance relationships. And unfortunately, there are so few animals left in the wild that they're really far apart um, and successful wild reproduction wasn't happening. You couldn't see any evidence of that. Um, now, more white abalone live in captivity, far more than do in, in the wild. And our restoration efforts now depend on reading a lot of animals in captivity and getting them out into the wild. So we have this kind of two step of an approach where we are cultivating a ton of animals um, and then our, we have partners that are basically putting them out in the wild. And the goal is to have enough of them out in the wild growing up big enough so that they're be, they'd be able to reproduce on their own. So the research has, we have three kind of approaches to the restoration of this species. So we study the diseases of the animals, which is the bottom left, their pathology. Um, we study the ecology and outplanting of the animals, um, which again is putting those captive bred animals out into the wild. And then we also study their reproduction and their development to try and improve um, making as many babies as possible. And the, um, uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife Shellfish Health Lab is the lab that really leads a lot of the pathology work or all of the pathology work. And they're just right across the hall here at BML, which is great because we get to work really closely with them. And one of the really cool things that they do um, is they make this wax treatment for our, especially our wild abalone that um, came from 
the wild, they sometimes have these sponges that bore into the shell and can damage the shell. So they make this beautiful wax treatment. It's like organic beeswax and like organic coconut oil. It'd be really good for your own skin. Um, but they basically get this spa treatment almost at least once a year um, to help um, improve their shell condition. Um, the outplanting and ecology work is led by NOAA with a ton of partners all over California. These are just some of them. Um, Oh, or actually all over California and Mexico. Um, and the reproduction and development work is also done with, a hu with these huge um, diversity of partnerships um, from aquarium to universities to federal scientists. And here at BML, um, I'm part of the team that houses the captive breeding program. So we're part of this really big program that's working to restore this species. And the focus of our research is to, um, in addition to actually producing as many white abalone as possible, is to try and figure out how to do that better. So we're trying to figure out how to improve reproduction and development. Um, and the biggest thing that we do is make the most um, white abalone of anywhere in the program. So this is a, a figure um, from when the, um, when the white abalone captive breeding program came to BML in 2012. Um, so in, in just the last 10 years, we've gone to making a, a few handfuls of animals to tens of thousands of one-year-olds um, every year. And this number is um, continuing to grow a bit or kind of plateauing at that tens of thousands every year. And despite that huge growth, we still don't produce enough to, to save the species. We're about an order of magnitude short of what we need to do to save the species. So our research is aiming to improve captive breeding, um, both with our like improving techniques and improving the outcomes of our, of our breeding efforts. Um, and one of the ways that we do that is by working on their reproductive condition. So these are photos of the gonads of animals, so the females on top and the her basically the eggs, you can kind of see them in gray. Um, and the the male, um, the, the male gonad is in white on the bottom. Um, and so we're trying to use diet, temperature, photo period, hormones, and understand the impact of disease and climate change on what's happening in the reproduction of our animals. So what we should see when we look underneath this shell and we look at the gonads is like a huge ripe gonad just ready to spawn every spring. Sometimes we see that from our really tiny animals. We never see it from our large animals. Um, but our the tiny animals that we do see it in are so tiny that they physically don't have enough space to have that many eggs. So a really good spawn from a, a ripe white abalone, she should be able to give us millions of eggs. But our broodstock are only producing hundreds of thousands of eggs, if that. Um, so we have a lot of work to do to understand why that is and how to improve it. And one of the things that we're working on is diet. Um, and so we're basically using diet as a tool to make them more reproductive. So abalone love eating giant kelp, but it's we say that it's kind of like junk food for them. It's not really nutritionally dense um, and they'll eat it because they love it. Um, but we know that dulse, which is a, the red algae on the right and on the, in the middle on the bottom there, um, that's more, it's higher in protein, um, it's generally more nutritious for them, and it's more, it's pretty nutritious for us too. Um, it's the the, uh, the algae that's been kind of in the news over the last few years, of like if you fry it, it tastes like bacon, you can buy it at Whole Foods, abalone like it too, and we've been culturing it here um, for over 10 years. Um, so that's one of the ways that we're improving our reproductive conditioning. Um, this is a photo I took just earlier today. <laughs> um, right now we're working on a really cool experiment where we're injecting um, some reproductive hormones that have been promising in other species to see if we can get our abalone to create more gametes and spawn better in the next few months. So we literally just started this today, which is really exciting. One of the other um, areas of our research and improving captive reproduction is examining um, what happens when the animals are really tiny, tiny babies. So once they're spawned, once there's eggs and sperm that meet and they become larvae, it, they'll settle on a substrate in about a week. So they're swimming around and then they settle. Um, we have about sometimes between 55 and 95% mortality. 
um, between settlement and the time when they're about three to six months old. And that's somewhat natural in, in, in animals that um, spawn huge numbers of offspring. They're going to have a, a lot of mortality um, in that early life stage. But if we can improve that by just like 1% and we can have we have females that might be able to spawn millions of eggs or even if they're only still spawning hundreds of thousands of eggs that's a lot more babies that we're producing every year so we're working um, with different cues for settling them and different feeds for that really early life stage um, and we're working on different experiments to improve their the veal the quality um, and quantity um, we just got a, a, a new grant to work with researchers at uh, UC Irvine um, to look at the role of fat and lipids in the diet and reproductive conditioning. Um, we have, I think it's a total of 10, but I should look that up, um, of wild animals in our program. Um, so the rest of the, the gametes that we get are from, you know, the children or grandchildren of those wild animals. Um, and so one of the things that we're working on now to improve the genetic diversity of the animals in the program is um, cryopreserving sperm so that we can potentially use that for future spawning attempts and improve our genetic diversity. Um, this is part of the work that, that NOAA leads um, that I'm not part of, but I, I wanted to show what ends up happening with the animals once we've created them and they've grown up, um, they go out into the wild. Um, and this is what one of those outplanting sites looks like. And so we have now animals that have been captively bred. Um, they were outplanted for, for the first time in 2019, which is a, an incredibly exciting time to be part of the program because um, the animals are finally going out in their home where they should be. Um, so we know that white abalone are really important. They're important culturally, economically, and ecologically um, because of the history of overfishing and, and also because of some disease pressures, they're gonna go extinct without our help. Um, and we have the tools to save them. They should be relatively easy to save. Um, and we're working on improving those tools. And also the knowledge and resources that we're using now to help us save white abalone they'll be able to enhance the sustainability and security of abalone fisheries and sustainable aquaculture. A lot of the things that we're doing are in partnership with sustainable aquaculture facilities. Um, and so we make sure that our, there's a lot of cross-pollination of our, our research and results. Thank you. Um, if you'd like to follow white abalone, um, a lot of our teams really produces a lot of really cute um, social media and exciting social media. Um, so please find us and you can also follow me at Powell Biologist, but I'm not nearly as entertaining as the White Album channel. <laughs> Hey there. Um, so yeah, we we're so happy that we got to hear from uh, Alyssa, those those snail pics. I'm never, never going to get over those. Um, Definitely follow White Abalone. I did like right after I finished talking to her. So <laughs> she also told me, I, I chatted with her a little bit afterwards. She also told me that um, they obviously like keep track of the pedigree of all the different you know, abalone that they're breeding and they've started to name them like really cute family names like Disney princesses. And she said she named one, there's one that was like Wally because it spawned, it was like the only one that spawned and it's a whole family anyway. So <laughs> more, more to see, go well, follow so, them. <laughs> so yeah, go follow them. Yeah, it's oh, so good. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, thank you so much to Kristen and Tristan and Mike and Alyssa for being part of this. Um, yes, Jacob, those faces. Yeah. Um, <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Um, just thanks so much to our guests for joining us tonight. Mm -hmm. And we, as in we, like the night school program, will be from here out coming to you the first and third Thursdays of every month. Um, that's a tongue twister. And our April 7th program, which is our, you know, first Thursday of April, is going to be featuring a lot of the Cal, uh, the Cal Academy's work in the Galapagos Islands, both past and present and future. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, stay tuned for that. Um, yeah. And then 
yeah, I know the schedule's been a little, you know, like <laughs> on and off throughout the last months, but first and third Thursdays and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you will never miss a night school um, mm -hmm. and tell your friends and family. Um, but yeah, thanks so much everyone for joining us. Hope you have a wonderful night and uh, yeah, see you soon. Yeah, good night. Take care. Good night.